So, how many times have you dozed off during the last few online lectures or meetings? I will tell you how you can stop mind wandering. Why is it so hard to stay focused? This is the University of the Netherlands. Perhaps you recognize the situation. You're sitting at your desk at home, staring at the screen, trying to pay attention. Your teacher is talking, explaining some complicated subject that you only half understand. Or maybe it's your boss telling your colleagues the agenda for the week. Now you hear your name mentioned and you think, wait, what just happened the last five minutes? It's a bit odd, isn't it? We know we should be paying attention, but our mind goes somewhere completely else. We don't choose to stop paying attention, it just happens. We don't even notice it right away, most of the time. My research lies in the domain of attention and perception. And there, we call this phenomenon mind-wandering. It's that moment when we stop paying attention to external stimuli, sounds and visual objects, and instead we focus on internal thoughts. Today I'm going to talk about why our minds wander, how we can become aware of it and what to do to stop our minds from mind wandering, especially when it's detrimental to the task at hand. So pay attention and by the end of this lecture you'll understand why it's so hard to keep listening to your boss in those online meetings and maybe also how we can help people focus in the future. First, I would like to point out that mind wandering is not always a bad thing. It actually has an important purpose in our lives. Think of any creative task. If you couldn't let your mind wander freely, it would be really hard to come up with new ideas. When you're lying in bed in the evening, almost falling asleep, your head is, head is probably full of ideas. Your thoughts are all over the place. This is the moment when our mind is completely free to wander. Another important task of mind wandering is to help us strengthen our memories. When we receive new information, our brain needs to process it. It needs to make connections between the new information and things we already know. It needs to make associations. The information that is first only in available in short-term memory needs to be stored in long-term memory. This process is called memory consolidation. To understand how it works, think back to some emotional conversation that you had recently. After the conversation finished, did you just move on? No, probably in your thoughts you went back to that moment in the days after, replaying that conversation in your mind. That too is mind wandering. And mind wandering here helps us create new memories. How do we know that somebody is mind wandering? The first challenge that we face in research on mind wandering is determining exactly when that moment happens. When is that moment when our head goes into the clouds while our boss is droning on in the background? Do you notice the exact moment when that happens? You probably only realize a bit later that you were not paying attention. And the first step in our experiments on mind wandering is to detect simple cues that help us detect that moment. What we do is that during a task that a participant is performing, we ask them a very simple question. At this particular moment, were you focused on the task or were you off task, thinking about something else? For example, we have participants in the lab perform a simple computer task while they're tracking a ball on the screen with their computer mouse. Now, every now and then, most of the time at random moments, we stop the experiment and ask the participant to tell us whether at that moment they were actually focused on the task or whether they were off task. The second step in this experiment would be that we would look for cues, both in the behavior of the participant, but also in the brain signals, that we could associate with this episode of mind wandering. We want to know what these cues are because they will help us detect that people are mind wandering before they themselves become aware of it. 
we also want to use these cues to be able to draw their attention back to the task by presenting them with subtle reminders, so-called nudging cues, that might help them improve their performance. But I'll come back to that later. Now, we know from past experiments that EEG technology, that's the technology that helps us measure brain waves, can help us a lot here. EEG, that's when you have a bathing cap on your head with a bunch of electrodes. Maybe you've seen experiments like that. Now, admittedly, it's difficult to collect precise EEG measurements in real life, so we have to do this in a lab. And in lab research, we can detect when people are focusing on sounds and sights in their environment by measuring the brain's responses. What's a little bit easier to implement in real life is the use of eye trackers to detect changes in eye movement. Why should eye movements be indicative of our thought processes? Some researchers call this the eye-mind link. It turns out that there is a measurable difference in how our eyes move when we're actively engaged with a task and moments when we're mind-wandering or daydreaming. The difference lies in how frequently we blink, how often our eyes move, and where and how long they fixate. Now, in a computer-based task, we can also use mouse tracking it turns out that people who are mind-wandering execute the mouse tracking movement in a sluggish way, with less purpose. Their trajectory, the tra trajectory of the movement might deviate from a movement when they would be focused. The more of these tools we can combine, the better we can determine exactly when mind-wandering occurs. So with all these tools, what have we found? Are we now able to tell that you're mind-wandering during an online meeting or in classes? I'm wondering, has your mind wandered yet during this lecture? Now, what's important to understand is that our brain wants to save energy. It's trying to predict if the incoming signals are worth paying attention to. Now, if you hear a very consistent and predictable sound, your brain may decide that it's not worth paying attention to. It's going to stay the same anyway. Think of this particular experience that many of us have. You're in a room and there is a loud air conditioning unit in the background. Now somebody turns it off and it's only at that moment that you notice it's completely quiet. It's only now that you realize how loud the air conditioning was. Your brain determined that the sound of the air conditioning was not interesting and it filtered it out. Now, this is nice and useful for air conditioning. Actually, imagine if we were not able to filter out these background noises. The problem is that our brain applies the same trick to your teacher's voice. If they have a very monotonous voice, for example, and they go on and on and on and on without breaks or interruptions, even the most wondrous and fascinating secrets of the universe would still be hard to pay attention to. Your brain just treats the teacher's voice as background noise. Now, there might be another reason why we are mind-wandering when we want to focus. Maybe the task at hand is not rewarding enough, given how much energy it costs. So, for instance, a difficult lecture where we see no immediate gain listening to might be a moment when our brain decides that it's more rewarding to think about something else. For example, what should I have for lunch today? That's a nice thought. But it may be also that you're stressed out. Maybe there is an important deadline coming up and your brain thinks that it's more urgent to focus on the deadline than to be concerned about what's happening on the screen. Now, this can even happen during conversations. It's not just when we're listening to online lectures. Somebody might be telling you a boring story and you're not paying attention to it. Now, we can detect this by analyzing different vocal features of your speech right after that. How is that? Well, because when we interact with someone, we have the tendency to adapt to their patterns of speech. Normally, we would match our speech in terms of our tone of voice, pronunciation, and speech tempo. 
But if we are mind wandering during the conversation, we're doing that less. So since matching vocal patterns, imitative behavior supports liking and affinity in social interactions, we see that mind wandering can actually have a negative impact in this area as well. So mind wandering can be counterproductive. And if you've ever been driving on a highway only to have someone cut in front of you while you weren't paying attention, you know it can even be quite dangerous. So how can we prevent it? Firstly, it turns out that mindful meditation practice can improve concentration. Even short breathing exercises can already help us in emotion regulation. So that we don't think back to that emotional conversation from earlier, but are able to let it go and focus on the task at hand. Secondly, using small signals, nudges to steer attention may be helpful. For example, if you're drifting off because your professor is going on and on and on and on, we could detect that you're mind wandering with an eye tracker built in the screen and by using a small change of lighting on the screen or maybe playing a soft sound that would break the monotony of the teacher's voice, we could bring you back in. Think back to the task with the ball. Do you notice how easier it is to track the ball's movement when the color of the ball changes? It's these types of cues that are unpredictable, so the brain doesn't filter them out, that help us ensure that attention stays fixed on the external stimuli and doesn't turn inward. This is likely the reason why some people use apps to help them studying. These apps may play different kinds of noise or maybe natural sounds. We know from experimental studies that noises like ping noise, which sounds like this, can improve attention to the task at hand. Now, I hear you thinking now, well, I'd rather not have someone track if my mind is wandering off during an online lecture. I'll just live with a bad grade instead. And that's understandable. But if you're driving a car and the car could detect that you're paying attention or not paying attention, in some situations that might save your life. So, how much of that did you pay attention to? If I were to ask you now which parts of the lecture you focused on, would you be able to answer why? Why did these parts stick in your memory? Maybe you noticed that there were parts of the lecture where I modulated my voice, whereas others were presented with a little bit boring, monotone pitch. The light in the room changed due to the visualizations in the background, and the camera shifted from one angle to another. Were these the moments you would remember the best? All these things can play a role in mind wandering. And the more we learn about when it happens, the better we'll be in helping you get your focus back. In the meantime, maybe you can play some pink noise in the background when you're trying to pay attention or concentrate. But also remember to let your mind wander every once in a while. You know now that mind wandering helps with memory and with creativity. Thank you for listening. Thank you.